Um, first of all, I should say I have a different David sitting to my right. <laughs> Always important to be paired with a David. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Lord Pryor. Well, common as muck. Has, it, well, it, well, you are. He is. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true, actually. <laughs> I certainly agree with you on the, on the for me, absolutely. I'm quite happy to be called that. So Lord Pryor is unable to be with us today. Um, so I'm going to physically chair the meeting. But David, in his capacity as the deputy chair of NHS England, is chairing the NHS England part of our committee in common, if that makes... Or board meeting in common, sorry. Indeed. OK, so thank you for doing but that. I'm hoping not to do very much. Well, should Leave you it in be your needed, tender you're, mercies. you're here. Um, the other apologies we've had are um, Andrew Morris, um, David Bean, and um, just at the last minute, Lord Darcy has had to go to a clinic um, to see some patients this <laughs> afternoon. Um, and we should also acknowledge um, this being Amanda Pritchard's first meeting. So very much welcome, Amanda, as the Chief Operating Officer and Chief Executive of NHS Improvement. So welcome to, to the much. team. Um, have we got any declarations of interest that need to be added to the register? Everyone happy? OK. Ooh. I can hear there's an interesting television programme going on in the background. Yeah, I think it's you, right? Is it me? That's even more disturbing. <laughs> um, <laughs> are there any comments on the minutes and matters arising from the last meeting? Any issues there? Should just pull out. Jessica, are anything on the matters arising that we need to bring up? No, it's all in hand. Okay, excellent. I know there was one that was a meeting that for Noel and I yes. with NHS resolution that is in the diary. Yeah. Um, if that's not clear. <coughs> excellent. Um, in which case, we'll just quickly move on to to my update. A um, couple of things that I wanted to to reference. Well, the first thing I'd like to do is to thank. Jeremy Hughes and the Alzheimer's Society, who have just run a fantastic Dementia Friends training session for uh, the non-execs, which has been a really brilliant break um, between board meetings to sort of help us learn, bring us back to really why we do this. Um, you see a number of us wearing our badges, but also just helping us really um, raise our awareness of what it feels like to have dementia and how all of us can play a role in making in the, our environments both in the NHS and at home more dementia friendly. So thank you to Jeremy and his team. Um, we are now all dementia friends, which is excellent. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, second thing, uh, since our last board meeting, uh, as ever, I have been out and about a fair bit. Uh, so, for example, I spent a absolutely um, eye-opening morning shadowing Dr Claire Gerarda in her clinic, um, which treats um, doctors, provides mental health support for doctors. Um, which was a, a great combination for me of getting closer to our mental health clinicians, but also with our people plan agenda on what we need to do to support our clinicians working in the NHS. And what Claire and her team in Vauxhall and across the country are doing is just that. So that was hugely helpful for me. But I've also been out and about looking at AI at Moorfields, at what Milton Keynes are doing in terms of engagement um, and becoming a great place to work. Been to East Surrey. Um, with the trusts that are working with Virginia Mason on continuous improvement, um, and to Bolton two weeks ago to open their urology unit. So I've been trying to get out about as much as usual. I used to write that down, but I like people to know where I've been going. Uh, and tomorrow, a number of us are off to Worthing to spend some time with Marianne Griffiths and her team, understanding the patient-first approach to improvement that they have in Worthing and in Brighton. Um, so those are my travels. And then the final thing I wanted to um, just put on the record, we will be writing out today to all um, provider chairs and lead governors of foundation trusts with um, some work that's been underway for the last 18 months, setting out a development framework for NHS chairs an appraisal framework that underpins that, uh, that development and competency framework and a remuneration framework for chairs and non-executive directors. Uh, it was, um, came to our people committee quite a while ago and has been working its way through the various levels of appro approval that um, remuneration does require. And so that will be heading out to the service writ large this afternoon. So that's my update. Any questions, comments? Excellent. In which case, we will hand over to, to Simon. 
So I think most of the substantive items we need to talk about are elsewhere on the agenda. Let me just mention uh, five things uh, briefly before we get into that. The first is that, as we previously discussed, the single biggest thing the health service has got to get right right now is better support for our frontline staff. We will next week, therefore, be allocating the £150 million pounds of uh, professional development funding, which since our last meeting, uh, Ruth and uh, colleagues, we've been able to secure, uh, which will mean that uh, frontline uh, nurses uh, and other health professionals will have that uh, earmarked training and development support uh, for the next uh, three years and beyond. Uh, there's obviously a lot of other work going on in terms of how to expand training pipelines and better support uh, for retention. Uh, our staff uh, currently at work, but that's a concrete uh, set of progress that's been made uh, since our last meeting. Uh, secondly, we have long argued that despite the fact that we've got a five-year <laughs> revenue funding settlement, the fact is that too much of our buildings and equipment is out of date and we have bottlenecks for diagnostics as a result of that uh, lack of uh, capital investment. Uh, since we last met, uh, we have seen uh, the uh, uh, improvements in the availability of capital funding for uh, the current year, a uh, billion pounds extra uh, of uh, permission to uh, fund capital investment uh, across the NHS and the beginnings of a uh, hospital replacement uh, programme with the first set of schemes announced. Uh, and we are hopeful that uh, that is just the beginning of what will be a bigger process of uh, hospital upgrades, but also mental health uh, services, community health services and uh, primary care as well. Thirdly, uh, if you talk to anybody across the front line of the NHS right now, they would say that the NHS is under real operational pressure. Uh, somebody uh, sort of put it uh, uh, in terms of sort of the NHS feels full at the moment. Uh, and so part of what we're going to be discussing this afternoon is the work underway not only to uh, try and deal with that in the here and now, but the broader service redesign agenda to relieve some of those pressures in the different parts of the system, of which the work with GPs, uh, the work on uh, same-day emergency care, many other things are all of a part. But frankly, that is uh, the key focus of uh, leaders across the NHS uh, right now. Fourthly, that is in the context then of the run-up to October 31st uh, and the uh, uh, exit uh, from the European Union. And so you're going to have a direct briefing from Keith Willett this afternoon around the NHS's preparations in conjunction with uh, the Department of Health and Social Care uh, and other parts of government. And fifthly, all of this is happening at a time when we are now in the final stages over the next two months or so in the bringing together of NHS England and NHS Improvement. And we have to record the fact that that means it's a time of quite considerable uncertainty for many hundreds of our staff uh, across both organisations, having had a big uh, consultation and discussion over the summer as to the shape that uh, that should look like. And so I just want to place on record, I think, uh, my thanks and our thanks as the entire board uh, for people who are continuing to work so diligently yeah. on those first four items while nevertheless personally experiencing the fifth. Absolutely. Excellent. Any questions, Ruth? That was more of a comment rather than a question. So, Dado, you and I were at the Queen's Nurse Institute um, one day this week, um, and both of us were given speeches, and yesterday I had the opportunity to speak with a number of dons from across England, directors of nursing from across England, and the overwhelming positive feeling about the CPD announcement of yes. um, nurses receiving... Uh, investment in their continued professional development. Not only is it appreciated about their own career um, progression, uh, but more likely to stay within the NHS, but also for patient safety, so they'll be safer uh, practitioners. So it's a great down payment, and uh, I know people are very much appreciative of that. No, I agree. David. Simon, um, your comments about the sort of NHS feeling full, I think, resonates with the all the conversations that we're having. I think when we come into the section later on, um, on sort of the performance um, report and so on, it would be really helpful to know what we're going to try and do to change that, given that we are running into winter in particular with whatever pressures that will bring. 
Absolutely, and uh, both Amanda and Pauline, I think, will uh, use the time to uh, get into that. There are some things that are in the gift of the NHS locally. There are some things we've got to get right nationally. There are some wider questions that, frankly, are still not properly resolved, of which the single biggest item is the pensions effect on the availability of uh, A&E uh, doctors, uh, surgeons, anaesthetists, uh, and that does need a definitive resolution because what uh, the rural colleges, what uh, clinical directors locally, individual doctors, our trust leaders are telling us is that that is having a material effect on the availability of staff to look after our patients. And you're confident that that's understood in the appropriate parts of government? I think it's understood that there is an issue, and now we need to move that understanding to a set of uh, conclusions that would resolve the matter. Okay. okay. Any other comments? Okay. In which case, um, we should move on to our next item, which is EU exit readiness. Um, Keith, <coughs> come and join us. Thank you. Oh, um, thank you very much. Uh, my role in this, as I was appointed as the strategic commander for EU exit for, for the NHS, uh, and with the responsibility for uh, taking the uh, NHS uh, and its uh, structures out of the European Union, if indeed that is the case on the 31st of October. And I would just remind everybody at this point in time that the legal default is that we, uh, the UK does leave the European Union on the 31st of October. So um, just to put things into context for, for everybody, um, the Department of Health and Social Care does lead the response uh, on EU exit and is responsible for the planning and the preparation of the health and care sector. So NHS England and NHS Improvement's roles are to support that process, uh, to prepare and, and um, plan for any issues or adverse incidents that may arise as a result uh, and take the opportunity for our benefits that could also accrue by the work that we're doing. Uh, I'm pleased to report that the NHS uh, is in a good uh, position of readiness at this point in time. Um, but we must recognise that the potential scale and scope of an ODL exit uh, means that there uh, undoubtedly will be some uh, issues and that there are elements that are outside uh, the control of NHS England or NHS Improvement and that we are dependent on government action in departments and also uh, on industry. There is a paper that's uh, laid before you which lays out the relationship with the uh, Department of Health and Social Care and the government uh, and also explains the operational response structure that we have put in place which includes a national coordination centre, regional coordination centre, a commercial and procurement cell as well as uh, structures within every NHS organisation to support uh, an EU uh, exit uh, and that Will, and they have been given advice and support to make ready. The make ready process has been uh, very individual. Uh, we have gone around the country uh, and helped 400 of the 400 NHS organisations. So that includes the clinical commissioning groups, the acute trusts, the ambulance services, mental health trusts, community trusts, uh, and as well as the key stakeholders to help them understand uh, what a no-deal exit impact means to them in terms of their workforce, the supply of medicines, medical devices, what it means around data and information flows, what it means around uh, the patients who are EU nationals living in the UK and indeed UK nationals living overseas. They've had so an extensive uh, um, exchange has gone on uh, and they, those organisations have been tasked to go back uh, and to make the changes and readiness uh, within themselves uh, in anticipation of a no deal exit. Uh, the particular issues that I raise in the paper are around, uh, obviously we have taken the NHS through this in the end of March and in mid-April, but this time there are some differences is that we are going into winter rather than coming out of winter and it's already been alluded to that there are will be significant pressures within the system uh, and we have aligned our winter operational response and our EU exit response and ensured that one isn't uh, uh, surging into the other as it were so that we are capable of managing what would be uh, a heightened level of demand. 
The other issue I have highlighted uh, in the paper is around our reliance on social care, a sector we know that is actually very fragile in many ways, uh, has had more uh, um, cuts over recent years, uh, and also is, has a different employment and provider model, uh, which makes it more difficult to have perhaps the same national grasp that we have uh, in the NHS, and how we have encouraged uh, the local health and care economies to come together so that the NHS indeed can support uh, social care where that will be of benefit, particularly if they start to get into difficulty. Uh, and the third aspect I've raised is that clearly uh, at the moment we don't know what the outcome and impact will be of a no deal exit. We have the government planning assumptions and we have worked to those. But it is possible that this, there could be issues going on for a lengthy period of time uh, and we will need to address the resilience within NHS England and NHS Improvement to manage what could be uh, a lengthy period of multiple issues. So uh, that's uh, perhaps a brief update, but I'm very happy, of course, to take any questions. Any comments or questions? Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. We had the uh, pleasure, really, of hearing the full briefing in the Audit Committee. I mean, is it possible just to expand on some of the risks around the social care workforce and what you think they may mean for the NHS and perhaps describe to us... Um, whether you have the team in place and the resources to, to fulfil this programme. So uh, on the social care workforce, yes, absolutely, and, and uh, that would be one of our uh, indirect risks, certainly in terms of the NHS. So the NHS workforce, about 6.5% uh, of our workforce are EU nationals. Uh, and they will all be working under terms and conditions in the NHS, particularly Agenda for Change, which covers care staff and nursing staff. Uh, in the social care sector, it's about 8% are EU nationals, but like the NHS, there is a significant variation across the country. So in London and the South East particular, there are very high numbers of EU nationals working in social care. Many of them will be on an unstructured pay scale and many on relatively low pay scales within that. Um, clearly, the NHS is very dependent on social care. We have about 100,000 beds in the NHS. In the care home sector alone, there are 450,000 beds and about a million in total looked after in the community. So any impact on the social care workforce, so either domiciliary care or to the care home provision, would have significant knock-on effects. Hence why I think the, we have been asking the NHS at the health uh, and local uh, and the social care uh, community locally, particularly through the local resilience fora, to focus on this, to understand each is business continuity uh, plans to a level that we haven't done before. The other issue, I think, in the social care workforce is the uh, provider sector is very fragmented. Something like 85% uh, of the care home provision are, are small or medium enterprises. They're not uh, large corporate organisations. And therefore, we don't have either the same level of information about how prepared they are or indeed um, what their plans are for, for resilience. Now, the Department of Health and Social Care has that responsibility and are working down through the Directors of Adult Social Care and MCHLG to get assurance in that sector, but clearly it is an area that remains vulnerable. And, uh, you know, within government planning assumptions which are public, there is a risk of, the, of sterling value changing, uh, and clearly that would have potentially another significant impact. I don't see the social care workforce uh, issue as being a day one issue, um, but it could certainly become an issue over time. Thank you. Any other questions? What help do you need? Uh, so I think for me the greatest uh, uh, help I could have in the lead up to the 31st of October is to ensure that events like this, we do get the information out to the public, to the NHS staff and to our patients, just how much preparation has gone on. And it is extensive mm -hmm. uh, across health uh, in particular. Uh, and they should be reassured that that has gone on. Also, uh, we have put in extensive uh, response models in order to deal with any incidents or issues that do arise. Now, that confidence needs to get to the public and to the patients, uh, because what would really hurt the NHS and therefore hurt patients would be if behaviours started to change unreasonably leading up to that. Yeah. So people started to do things differently, ask for more medicines, that sort of thing, which would clearly make, create difficulties within the system, which need not be there, because all of that has been managed uh, well upstream. And we're very used to it. The NHS 
uh, and our staff in the NHS in particular are used to managing risk day in, day out. That's what we do, whether you're the bed manager in a hospital allocating patients, whether you're the nurse in A&E or the GP in the surgery or the paramedic at an accident scene. Managing risk and prioritising is what we do, so I think the public and our patients can trust that we will do that through whatever is presented to us. Thank you, Keith. Keith, I was just going to expand on that point because, as you just alluded to, the NHS, both nationally, regionally and frontline staff, are very used to uh, dealing with issues that arise often uh, uh, with short notice uh, where uh, we need to course correct or we need to put in, um, um, in support uh, for supply chain disruption, etc. So, so I, I wondered if you could expand a little bit on the sense of uh, where the planning is building on expertise that we already have uh, and where there may be some new risks and what you have done to mitigate those new risks. So, thank you. So, um, I'll, I'll use medicines as the example because that's probably the easiest. So, so, there are shortages of medicines all the time, and there have been for years. Um, at any one time, there are dozens, if not uh, up to 100 medicines that the NHS will be aware that are in, have some shortage. That's business as usual for us. Most of those are managed well upstream with the suppliers, with the manufacturers, and very rarely do they come to uh, even to the notice of the public or patients. So that system is all in place. Um, we've had that, that established across government and across the NHS for many years. Um, what we've done is throughout the EU exit planning, um, we have enhanced all the elements in the normal pathways that we use. So we're not asking people to do anything different within the organisations. We're doing following the business as usual functions, how they identify problems, how they escalate problems to make us aware nationally, and then we've increased the capacity to manage those nationally. So that's why I'm saying we're confidently well prepared in that regard. Can you say a bit more about how you're working with other departments within government? Because, of course, not working in spent isolation, you have to interface with other people. No, I'm, I'm pleased to say that having taken on this role, um, one of the first things was that the uh, Department of Health and Social Care very much adopted the NHS into their structures. So we are represented on all their boards, their assurance boards, their supply boards, um, and their operational boards, working very closely. Uh, they obviously have the direct uh, access to their government departments, but I have been confident that they have uh, given me all the information I need for the NHS to make the necessary responses. Um, and indeed, where appropriate, I've actually joined them to meet with other departments, particularly perhaps the Department for Transport, which are key in terms of the freight capacity and the uh, uh, su supply chain for the NHS. And indeed, I've, I'm working with the Cabinet Office as well. So in that regard, we've had a very good relationship. Thank you. Keith, is there anything else that you need from us? Um, mindful particularly, as Simon said earlier, the... Um, degree of um, additional workload that um, people are feeling within NHS England and NHS Improvement as we bring our two organisations together, that extra stress. Is there anything you need from us as, uh, as two combined boards to help you? So I think that is keeping this very much on the agenda and recognising the pressures in the system um, at all levels in the NHS, across NHS England and Improvement staff, but also very much down to the, the frontline staff and across the community and including social care. I think we need to keep that very high on our agenda, uh, monitor it very carefully and be prepared to, to respond uh, as and when issues arise. I think it will, we're always good for managing incidents and problems over a period of a few weeks and into a few months, but there is a, a risk of exhaustion there, yeah. um, and I think that will coincide with the winter, and therefore we will need to be particularly sensitive yeah. to that risk. Yeah, wise words, wise words. Any further questions or comments? In which case, can we just formally thank you and your team and your growing body of... Could we move on um, to digital first? Oh, sorry, I've stepped, missed one to legislation. Ian. Thank you very uh, much, um, In February, we published our draft proposals. Uh, we struck a chord generating 192,806 written responses. In parallel, the Health and Social Care Select Committee conducted an inquiry. In June, it published its conclusions and recommendations, welcoming our approach, albeit with important caveats. Since then, my team and I have worked intensively with many organisations to shape our final proposals, 
and reflect the advice of the Select Committee. And today I'm pleased to report that we have achieved a clear consensus. This morning a broad coalition wrote to the Secretary of State, um, and I quote, with unanimous support for a focused NHS bill within the forthcoming Queen's speech. They welcomed our recommendations and encouraged the government to continue the process of co-production. Um, the organisations are the NHS Confederation, NHS providers, NHS employers, NHS clinical commissioners, the Community Provider Network, the King's Fund, the Royal College of Nursing, the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, the Royal College of General Practitioners, the Local Government Association, the Patients Association, Health Watch England, the Richmond Group of 14 major health charities, National Voices, Unison, ICS Leaders and the NHS Assembly Co-Chairs. Turning to our recommendations, we continue to say scrap Section 75 of the Health and Social Care Act 2012 remove the 2012 Act role of the Competition and Mergers Authority and remove the NHS from jurisdiction of the Public Contract Regulations 2015. Our proposed best value regime should be renamed, co-produced with the NHS Assembly and published in draft alongside a bill. Patient choice should be protected the triple aim duty should include well-being as well as health. It should include a new duty to engage local communities. The government should also explore establishing the principle of community co-production within the NHS constitution. We drop the proposal to force provider mergers. The proposal to set capital controls for foundation trusts has been heavily circumscribed as a reserve power only with numerous safeguards. Only NHS providers should be able to hold integrated care provider contracts. Integrated care systems should be further supported and strengthened by the ability to create joint committees across multiple providers and commissioners and the transparency of their decision-making improved. As the boards have previously discussed, we recommend the full legal merger of NHS England and NHS Improvement, which is, of course, actually Monitor and the Trust Development Authority. Given these three have different accountability arrangements, that will have to be reviewed and clarified in a bill. The proposal to allow the Secretary of State to change arm's length body functions should be dropped. The government should revisit national accountabilities for workforce functions as advocated by the Royal College of Nursing and others. In order to make integrated care a reality, other changes are needed that don't need legislation and there may be a case for the department additionally to consider whether a bill could help by providing a clear and transparent underpinning for information sharing and IT interoperability within the NHS. Um, so we were asked by government to make recommendations. Um, uh, we have now demonstrably uh, channeled what the NHS and its wider partners in local government and the voluntary and community sector want and do not want from NHS legislation. And I commend these proposals to our boards, to government and to parliament. Thank you. Questions or comments? Pat? Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I think it was a remarkable response. 192,000. I think it's, it does show the, the depth of uh, sort of commitment to the service out there and their wish to be involved and the fact that the fact that we've listened. Um, I just want, on a specific, I just wonder if you'd expand a bit upon the, the select committee's airless room and, uh, you know, what, what the thinking is there about ensuring choice. So, um, the select committee were quoting um, David Hare. Um, who represents NHS, um, a, a particular set of uh, providers. Um, and their view was that it's very important that um, in the best interests of patients and the public, um, the core principles of patient choice 
um, which had been enshrined in the NHS since its inception in 1948. The very first line, first choose your GP, actually are maintained. So how do we make sure that that happens alongside the increased collaboration? Thank you. Ruth. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Ian, um, for all of the work that you've done on the, a wide range of these uh, issues. But referring particularly to the recommendation number 26, um, I'm grateful um, and I support wholeheartedly the recommendation that the government does now revisit with partners, the RCN, Royal College of Midwifery, Midwives, um, UNICEF and others as well, how we um, look at the responsibility nationally for duties in terms of um, workforce functions and accountability and having more clarity on that, um, I certainly would welcome as Chief Nursing Officer, so thank you. Other questions or comments? Sam, is there anything that you'd like to... Well, I mean, as Ian implies, we are actually building on a big consensus that has emerged across the NHS about some of the changes that people would like to see, rightly so, in order to accelerate uh, joined-up care and the long-term plan implementation. I don't think anybody's uh, naive about the particular parliamentary circumstances facing the nation right now. So this is not just a question uh, for the immediate here and now. This is actually whenever that time comes uh, for Parliament to address these matters, here is a very solid and consensus-based uh, set of practical proposals. And uh, you know whether that time uh, is uh, imminent uh, or a little way off, uh, these proposals will be ready uh, for that moment. Well, just one quick question. Um, Ian, were you able to uh, estimate the, the, the sort of benefit, the sort of cost-saving perspective of the duplication that's been present in the system to the benefit of actually yeah. implementing this? I don't have a, a particular number I can quote, but one of the things that the NHS has been saying, particularly in relation to procurement, is that there's an automatic requirement now under the existing legislation, the combination of Section 75 and then the public procurement regulations, that when you hit a trigger point, there has to be a procurement for those services. And we hear not just from commissioners and NHS providers, but also um, other providers, including um, in the independent sector, that say, look, it's nuts to have to go through this procurement process. Um, and what we're trying to do is to make sure that we can reduce avoidable bureaucracy associated with that. And what the proposals overall are, are mainly doing is they're removing barriers. So restrictions that make it hard for people to work with each other. And that's really the essence of almost everything in this set of propositions. Thank you. So on that basis, are both boards happy to approve these recommendations? Yeah. Excellent. Oops. Great piece of work. Uh, so now we will move on to digital first primary care. If um, Dr. Nikki Kanani and Ed Waller can join us. The chairs for both of you, just. We're, we're used to getting um, cosy on this side of the table, so thank you for having <laughs> us. And um, we're asking you to formally um, agree the publication of our Digital First Primary Care Consultation, which you'll all have in your packs today. Um, and a huge thank you to the teams who have pulled this together. It was a truly um, heroic effort, um, and I hope that it answers a lot of the questions that you have been asking over the past few months. Um, to set the scene, I'm Nikki. I'm a GP in London and Director of Primary Care here at NHS ENI. And I'm Edwell. I'm the Director responsible for Primary Care Strategy in our NHS contracting regimes. And this is part, I think, of a wider narrative. We've all got examples of um, places around the country where general practice particularly can offer really good <coughs> digital services for their patients. Um, and actually, I think for decades, uh, general practice have been digital pioneers. And we can see those examples in some spaces around the country. And what we want to do is offer that to all of our patients around the country. Um, I still struggle sometimes to log on in my own practice. Um, and I want to make sure that that isn't the case for my colleagues, because actually, we've got far more to focus on. Um, and, and actually more so for our patients. Um, recently I had a patient tell me that as a nomadic boat dweller she is unable to get the care that she really needs. What that meant for her was that she was diagnosed with breast cancer at stage four. We can avoid that and what this paper does is begin to set out that story and those first steps. 
this story actually started last year when we began to negotiate the GP contract and when we came to you in January to set out that we will offer digital first care across primary care by 2020-2021. And what that really means is making sure that all our practices can digitise their offer. So actually, we don't talk about digital first primary care, but primary care, offering all manners of ways to access your appropriate primary care professional, because that's not always going to be the GP. And in fact, over the next five years, as we see more staff coming into general practice and primary care, it could be and it will be the right person for the care needs that you have. So we've set out a framework and we've set out a time frame. And this framework and time frame will need time and capacity to embed in general practice because it is a change that will be taking our practices on, but one that we must necessarily do. As we've gone through this journey, we've realised that there are a number of key questions that we need to answer in order to really get us effectively on that journey, um, this being very much the beginning. And I'm going to ask Ed to set out some of those key additional requirements that are in the pack, and then we can open up to questions. Thanks, Nikki. So the consultation itself focused on some of the changes we think we thought were required to the commissioning contracting regimes to take account of the fact that new models of primary care were expanding uh, and expanding in a way that wasn't foreseen when the commissioning contracting arrangements were designed. So effectively, we had providers who were registering patients as out-of-area patients, i.e. outside their GP practices catchment, and providing to them a digital-first offer. A digital-first offer we think patients should have the choice of, and as Nikki described, would, would, by 2021 all patients will have that type of service. But we need to uh, reconcile some of the way that is currently working with the rules. Um, and we can break that down into three categories. So on the first, we propose that where a provider registers lots of patients out of their practice catchment area, there should be a threshold at which that list is broken up to return patients to a practice list that is uh, res registered, registers them in their own CCG and allows those patients to be delivered integrated care with other providers. So above 1,000 patients, we're going to take forward a proposal to disaggregate large contracts that are registered out of area patients, and uh, new APMS lists will be established in the CCGs where more than 1,000 patients are residing, and those new APMS providers will be required to join local primary care networks. In the first instance, that means a single list operating in Hammersmith and Fulham will turn into 17 lists, one in Hammersmith and Fulham and one in 16 other CCGs where more than 1,000 patients are registered. There are then a set of financial questions. Um, one of them is the speed at which the financial allocation process reconciles large-scale movements of patients. Um, we are taking forward on the back of the consultation a mechanism that would speed up the reconciliation process so that uh, between uh, financial years, a quarterly mechanism would, uh, would reconcile the movement of large numbers of patients between CCGs. And that will take account of the demography of those patients, their age and their gender, and take account of the practices uh, position from whence they came and the deprivation of the, of, the, of, the, of the original practice. We also asked questions around the way in which we fund practices and whether digital first models um, should, uh, ask us, uh, should cause us to uh, ask questions about whether that was right. Um, one of those questions was around whether out of area patients, and these are patients who register away from their home, uh, should be uh, should be um, should count should have less value in the uh, general practice funding formula than patients who are in area patients, um, and the reason for that would be the obligation on the GP to provide home visits disappears. We're very clear that the proportionality of rejigging the entire NHS uh, primary care allocation system to try and account for what are a very small number of patients, most of whom don't actually receive home visits because of their demographics, would be totally disproportionate. We propose to leave that as it is. And we also asked about whether um, the 46% that a practice receives for a new patient to, uh, um, to take account of the extra work involved in registering a new patient should be changed to take account of digital models. We've heard very strong feedback through the consultation that to try and uh, make changes to that mechanism also runs the risk of destabilising practices who have a naturally high turnover. And again, the proportionality of the number of people we're talking about on the digital first models 
doesn't warrant um, doesn't warrant changing that system. The final thing the consultation uh, asked and which we're now proposing to take forward is a mechanism by which uh, underdoctored parts of England uh, would become places where new lists could be established under a nationally run uh, procurement regime. We would nationally certify providers who were suitable to take up opportunities automatically in the places where uh, in the 20% most uh, underdoctored CCGs. Um, and that builds on the fact that in the early evaluations of digital first models, there is some emerging evidence that you can bring in GP capacity through digital first provision that isn't available if you try and uh, force people to work in a face to face model. And we want to make sure if that is going to happen, it happens in the places that need doctors most. Uh, in terms of next steps, um, the, uh, the requirement to disaggregate lists uh, that are large and based on out of air registration. Um, requires changes to the law. It requires the department to change the regulations governing the GP contract. Um, we will need to discuss the details of that with the BMA and hope to implement it as soon as changes can be made, which might well be as soon as April. So, thank you. I hope this um, offers a balance between digital innovation and how to future-proof ourselves, but um, continues to value continuity of care, which we I know we highly value within uh, current uh, models of general practice. I'm happy to take questions. Manir. Hi, thanks very much for that. Can you explain how you came up with the number of 1,000 as your threshold? So the original consultation proposed that the number should be between 1,000 and 2,000. Uh, and we're trying to balance two things, really. Um, we're trying to balance the fact that we're trying to return patients to a practice that is based locally and uh, is able to integrate the care it offers with other local services as soon as it is practical to manage the implications of running a practice, i.e. you have enough patients to make running a practice sustainable. Um, we got a lot of consultation feedback about where that boundary was um, and settled on 1,000 as, as a sort of practical uh, midpoint in some of the considerations we had to we had to take account of on that. Okay. No. Um, yeah, I think this is um, a very positive step forward overall, and thank you very much for pulling it all together. It, with respect to paragraph twelve on how you're targeting new opportunities on areas of greatest need, and some of those areas of greatest need are in deprived areas. You know, in NHS Digital, we spend a lot of time testing digital products on the spectrum of inequalities and the spectrum of needs, particularly in areas which are not digitally um, adept. When you certify nationally some of the providers for digital first services, what kind of assurance mechanisms do you think you'll have in place to ensure they adopt the same standards of testing suitability of digital products in deprived areas as we do today. Um, so the next phase of this work is actually to design precisely what con APMS contractual arrangement those new market entrants would be offered, and the processes by which we would we would do we'd make such as, uh, assurances as that. Um, I think one of the important things on uh, accessibility is that we want to put a requirement on, on any provider that enters the market in, in one of these areas to make an effort to register with their in their provider model a cross-section of the population. So this shouldn't be about um, you know, putting providers into underdoctored parts of England and then providing services preferentially to people who might well be uh, even in that CCG you know, receiving better health care than others. So thank you for that. I, I wanted to just sort of um, ask about the, the broadening the lens of it. I think when we talk about digital first primary care, um, we can sometimes get a bit over focused on video consultations between patients and professionals, which I would sort of call remote doctoring. It's a great thing to have. Um, but actually, if you ask patients um, in a more sort of market research sort of way, what do they want? What do they want? Um, 
you'll hear a lot about, I want to be able to monitor my, my long-term condition using an app. I want to be able to ask clinicians a question. I want to be able to sort out my appointments. I want to be able to sort out my medicines. I want to be able to see my record. So um, I, I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about how you see the stuff beyond the, if you like, the remote doctoring and the appointments, how that might develop um, as a result of the proposals that you're putting forward. Great, so I'll, I'll kick off if that's all right. Um, this is something we've been considering really closely through the National Review of Access, which I'm currently chairing. Um, a big part of this is exactly what you describe. What patients um, talk about is much more about um, controlling and re-empowering themselves with their own health care. So actually what they want to be able to do is uh, not phone 200 times to get hold of their GP and not have to um, almost fight to get their information uploaded or to pull down their own information. So I think this is just the beginning of setting out what the sort of what the basic offer is across general practice but particularly through primary care networks we'll be able to offer a much wider array of services. So working with colleagues in um, NHSX we're talking about um, tech banks so people can then get their um, iPads to do their remote monitoring of their long-term condition um, to make sure that apps are fully interoperable and can sit behind the NHS app so that they can people can look after their own health care. Um, I mean, as, as I say, my, my children are 7 and 11 and they're not going to sit in a GP surgery waiting for pretty much any aspect of their health care. We need to be really mindful of that as we develop. So I think the, the um, implications are huge in terms of how we can support practices to broaden their offer, but with the support and resilience of other practices through the network. I, mean, I guess the only other thing to add is that the GP contract deal that the board saw in January also set out a series of milestones on the provision of services in a digital manner. So, for example, this year we'll see 25% of practice appointments available to book online, and the same uh, sort of requirement is in place around ac online access to your patient record, prescription ordering, etc. So slowly the whole system moves towards a whole gamut of things being provided in a digital way. Essential in closing what will otherwise be an ever widening gap yeah. between the workforce that we have available and the increase, people's increasing health needs. So that focus on using technology to improve people's ability to look after themselves and to, as you say, take yes. power and control back is just really encouraging. Thank and, you. and just aside, the I think it's the second or third. Um, paragraph here we talk about the change management capacity that general practice needs and primary care and it's almost we need to just set aside the tech slightly because once once we get that right and we get people feeling more comfortable with their tech and you know uh, the fax machines that definitely aren't in my surgery are um, moved away from we we will be on a different journey with developing tech and embedding it in, in the way that you describe thank you any further questions or comments In which case, are we happy to approve the recommendations? Well done. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay. So we move on now to the clinically led review of NHS access standards. Steve, are you going to kick yes, us off? Yes, thank you, Dido. Um, so as the board will uh, recall, in June of last year, the uh, Prime Minister uh, asked uh, NHS England uh, as part of the development of the long-term plan to review the key uh, access uh, standards used within the NHS uh, in England. Uh, and um, specifically, uh, the ask was to ensure that uh, in developing a service plan for the next uh, five to ten years, we ensured that those access uh, standards were up to date and were fit for purpose for the service developments uh, that we would be uh, proposing. Uh, and I guess you can think about that in two ways, and we approached it in two ways. Firstly, uh, for some of these standards which have been in place for uh, up to 15 years, uh, what have we learned, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, and in essence, how could we improve upon uh, the current standards? Uh, and secondly, uh, as I've alluded to in terms of uh, so the service models that have developed during that period, uh, and in our work set out in the long-term plan to develop them further, uh, are those standards supportive of the direction of travel uh, that those uh, service models are taking? I.e., do they support the service and support patients in delivering uh, the service uh, models that uh, we uh, that we uh, have developed and we are proposing? 
Um, so the long-term plan was published in uh, January, and uh, in that we promised that we would publish an interim report uh, in the spring, and we did so in March, uh, publish uh, uh, an interim uh, report which set out uh, a proposed set of updated and improved standards. I'm not going to go through those in detail. They are summarised in the paper and, of course, in more detail in the already published interim report. But I will remind the Board that they're in four key areas. Uh, the first is urgent uh, and emergency care, uh, where there have been uh, standards, the A&E 4R standard, uh, for around 15 years. Uh, in elective care, where a key standard is around uh, 18 weeks um, standard tr for treatment uh, from referral. Uh, in cancer, where a key standard is a 62-day uh, standard from referral to first treatment and some two-week access standards. And in mental health, and I think particularly important in mental health, uh, this is an area where we have had very few access standards and I think the importance of uh, proposing a set of standards in mental health that will bring mental health parity in terms of access standards with physical health uh, is extremely important. Um, so as part of that report, uh, we um, emphasised the importance of testing the proposed standards uh, to ensure that we learned uh, how they might work uh, in, in the real world uh, rather than uh, on, uh, in a report. And, and therefore, in the next phase of the work, uh, we have moved into a testing process uh, with NHS organisations. Uh, we commenced the uh, testing in the early summer, so urgent and emergency care went first uh, at the end of May. And we have been rolling out uh, testing uh, over the last few months and will continue to roll that. Now, by nature of these standards and by nature of the patient pathways and journeys that they encompass, uh, the testing periods will be different uh, for each of the standards and therefore the timelines are not unified into one single timeline. So as I've said, urgent and emergency care we rolled out first and probably some of the mental health standards we will be rolling out uh, towards uh, the end of the uh, testing period. Um, so at this point I should pause to say that I am extremely grateful, as I think we all are, to those NHS organisations that have joined with us uh, and agreed to be test sites. I don't underestimate the work involved uh, in doing that uh, and for the around a dozen or so, uh, depending on the testing area that we have used in each of uh, these uh, uh, protocols, testing protocols. I'm really grateful to the organisations, the boards, and indeed the frontline staff uh, who have uh, joined us on this journey to test a set of new uh, improved uh, standards. Um, I'm not going to comment in detail on them. Uh, we may comment a bit more on urgent and emergency care because that has been going the longest and I'm really grateful to Pauline Phillips and the team. Pauline is over there uh, who's been leading this uh, and Pauline might want to, want to comment on uh, some of the high level uh, learning from that initial phase. But I, I would say that uh, our experience has been that the sites that we have recruited uh, uh, have uh, um, enjoyed working on this. They want to be part of the journey uh, of improving standards and they have worked very closely with us and they uh, have uh, found it useful, interesting and helpful to be able to revisit some of the uh, some of the aspects of their operational performance. So in urgent emergency care, where we have suggested a standard that encompasses total time that a patient spends in uh, an A&E department, rather than focusing just on a four-hour period, has allowed uh, organisations to really think about every minute that a patient spends in an A&E department. Um, it's too early to uh, discuss data in detail, but as I say, uh, Pauline may want to give some more high-level uh, information. Um, the third point I would make in introducing the paper is that we have always involved partners in the development of this, and since March we have expanded the uh, stakeholders and partners uh, that we have uh, worked with. So we have, in addition to an oversight group that has uh, looked at the work as a whole, we have uh, introduced specific expert groups in all of the four areas, uh, in cancer and mental health, using groups that we already have as part of the long-term plan. And, and that has been invaluable in giving us particular expert advice. And again, I'm very grateful to those uh, organisations and those individuals who've worked with us on this. And that includes a variety of professional groups, such as colleges, uh, both uh, colleges of doctors and colleges of nurses and others, uh, to 
two patient groups and two charities. Um, and uh, their ongoing help in this is really important. Um, and finally, I would say something about next steps, which is again uh, in the paper. So firstly, we will be continuing testing. As I said at the start, we are still relatively in the early phases of some of the testing, uh, so we have more to do. Secondly, we have committed to evaluation, so we are evaluating in a number of ways, and uh, some of our patient groups are, have very kindly stepped up to, uh, to undertake evaluation in terms of patient experience, and I'm very grateful to Health Watch and others. And then we are commissioning uh, uh, academic partners or an academic partner uh, for some of the uh, evaluation uh, as well. Uh, we also uh, wish to consult. Uh, the point at which we do is contingent, of course, on the testing and a number of other uh, things, uh, but uh, that is something that um, uh, we committed uh, to do and uh, we remain committed to do. So I think I will pause there to take questions. Uh, Pauline, do you want to add anything additional at the high level on the urgent emergency care? Because I know that's uh, something that you're very involved in. Um, I, I think, Steve, just to reinforce what you've said, and you know, I think by working with the 14 departments, um, there is a real atmosphere in those departments that every minute counts for every patient, and I think that's why we've had a, a significant level of clinical interest in this, and if by counting other metrics will it support our transformation journey better than the metrics we have at the moment and um, clearly it's still very early days and we need time for those departments to collect more data and um, at the moment the focus has been on the mean and um, but also time to initial assessment and now increasingly on the critical conditions um, the patients that we would expect to be seen in a very short time. But I think an awful lot of cooperation from the 14 departments, and we're really pleased about that. Thank you. John. Thank you, Steve. I think this is tremendously interesting. And, and the, I guess the question I would ask is that um, it, it sounds like you're taking this to a, you know, a really good level of sophistication and testing it um, you know, extremely thoroughly. From the point of view of the kind of member of the public, um, the, the existing standards, I mean, they may be crude and um, they may be uh, subject, uh, susceptible to some gaming and they might be being imp imposed in, some, in ways that some people might consider a bit sort of crude and brutal. But they have a couple of real merits, don't they? One is they're very easy to understand. And the second thing is that they have had a dramatic effect on waiting time. It is argued that they had a dramatic effect on waiting time. So... Can you, can you help us understand um, how, how, whether you see those, as, those advantages as being somehow maintained in the, the new system? What, what, what are the trade-offs between the sort of simple, brutal, effective versus something which sounds as if it might be a little bit more technocratic and a bit more difficult to kind of get one's mind around? Yes. So, of course, as I said uh, at the start in the introduction, we have existing standards and they have uh, in many ways served us well in, in the years that we have used them, but they have strengths and weaknesses. Uh, it is not actually the case that they are always as well understood as we think. And there is uh, often confusion over the four-hour standard, for example, and uh, um, um, a recent, I think, Times article was uh, corrected in a letter um, from, I think, a retired doctor who pointed out that the four-hour standard is, is, is from uh, um, arrival through to the completion of treatment rather than initial uh, treatment. Uh, so we still see confusion in the minds uh, even of those uh, august people who write in newspapers uh, over, over these standards. So I don't think it is universally the case that every standard is as well understood as we might like to think. Uh, but n nevertheless, um, what we are trying to do is to introduce, as I say, a set of standards or propose a set that will move us on and build on what we have already. And, and, and very much a set of standards that is understandable to staff and patients is one of those criteria, which is exactly why we have asked Healthwatch and others to help us in assessing that. And Healthwatch have been use, uh, very helpful in not only helping us understand what patients currently think, but they will be assessing what patients think as we start to develop new standards. Um, and I should say, personally, I have tried to very much approach this as a patient rather than a doctor. Uh, because I'm a patient as well as a doctor. Uh, and I think in setting any set of standards, uh, it's important that there is a narrative that is as simple as possible for the patient, but also for staff. Uh, and of course, those are not always the same. 
uh, but I think it is important to get the balance right. So in cancer, for instance, where we are really moving towards early diagnosis because we wish early diagnosis, we know that uh, earlier diagnosis of cancer means that diagnosis uh, that is picked the cancer is picked up at an earlier stage and that means that treatment is more effective and that outcomes are better. So moving to a standard that focuses on faster diagnosis, in other words, says uh, to the citizen of England that from the point of referral to a, an urgent cancer service, you will have a diagnosis within 28 days most of the time of which is that you don't have cancer, but you will get that diagnosis in 28 days, begins to shift the emphasis of what we do onto picking up cancer and diagnosing quickly. Uh, so, so there is merit not only in what we wish these standards to support operationally, but the message that they convey uh, around what our intent is. Can I just ask you a little bit about the timescales <coughs> on this? Because we're, we're field testing moment, we said that we would be looking to introduce new standards from April 20. We've got evaluation and then consultation and then approval to go through. And what I, I guess until I get my head around on this is, <clears throat> is when as a board do we start to see the evaluation and to, and to think then about how we consult in the next steps Yes, so, because they are so they are so critical of these standards. Yeah, so so as I said, um, there are a number, uh, the various uh, standards or the various testing is 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 um, being approached in different timelines. So um, there are a number of things that we need to consider in the overall timeline. One is the individual timeline. So mental health will take us longer right. uh, because of the uh, deployment of resource into the system. Uh, as part of the long-term plan and indeed the five-year forward view in mental health which will allow those standards to be introduced. Um, the outcome of testing, so obviously we want the testing to uh, um, support uh, recommendations and introduction of standards if that's what we choose to do or choose to recommend uh, and of course we're still in that testing phase. Um, there are a number of obviously key points in the NHS rhythm of the year. Mm -hmm. The 1st of April is a very important point, not <coughs> just uh, because it's our financial year, because it is the point at which the mandate for the year yeah. from the government uh, takes effect. So, so um, we are working towards, uh, if everything uh, goes as uh, we would wish, uh, possibly a 1st of April implementation for urgent and emergency care. Uh, but on the others, uh, and, and very possibly for the cancer 28-day standard, but we will need to work and see where we are over the next month or two in terms of the pilots. The consultation is also important, and we need to work that in. Uh, and, of course, uh, some of these, uh, in particular on elective care and in uh, cancer, uh, are in the... Um, uh, NHS constitution and we are working closely with the Department of Health and Social Care over the approach to legislative changes if they are required uh, in order to progress those. So a number of moving parts but some in indicative thoughts in our minds. I think you answered the second part of the question I was asked, which was do these automatically then, if, you, if we have new standards, they automatically roll into, into the constitution as replacements for existing so, ones? So, it, it it so, so I'm not going to give you a complex answer because Don't it's a complex a answer, uh, which is why I think I chose my words carefully and said potentially, because it rather depends okay. what we recommend and how we recommend okay. it and the approach we take. But, but yes, uh, it may require possibly secondary legislation, but, but that is still to be arrived okay. at. Quite a lot of conditional... I, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> absolutely that conditioning sentence. that with a lot of conditions <laughs> until we know what we're recommending I can't okay. give you the answer that is fair enough other questions or comments on this so this is going to be coming back uh, several <coughs> times I expect so um, good to have uh, an update and thank you to everyone who's working so hard out in the trusts um, testing and trialling this Okay, thank you. So we move on, actually it flows nicely, to current operational quality and financial performance. Um, I thought we might start um, on the sort of operational and quality side and um, start by welcoming Amanda and having you just give us your sort of first impressions and then 
I'm sure you'll hand over to Pauline and then Julian. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I think uh, I think we discussed this sort of at the very outset of the meeting that what um, we see in operational performance at the moment actually is the NHS doing largely an extraordinary job despite really quite significant pressure. So I think it's really, we're very aware of just quite how hard colleagues from across the whole of the NHS are working every day to provide you know, the best possible care for patients, to do that as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. And in the paper, there are some real things to celebrate. So we've got not only the increase in activity, the year-on-year -year, uh, improvements that are set out, but also, I think, crucially, some of the uh, developments around the transformation agenda, so the new services that we're introducing. So we can see in the paper, we talk about, and Pauline will say more about this, increase in same-day emergency care, the acute frailty provision that's being rolled out, uh, the we're about to roll out targeted health checks uh, for um, patients who may have lung cancer, uh, the HPV vaccination for year eight boys, which is about to start again, roll out. And I think the other thing that's just um, an, a, another thing to celebrate really is that year on year increase in mental health funding, which again, we're seeing translate into reduced waiting times for treatment. Um, so setting all of that as the context, um, and we talked about it earlier, I think there is very real pressure in the system. So we talked about pensions. I think it is it's worth probably coming back to that because uh, there's no doubt uh, that that is having a material impact on capacity at exactly the same time as we're seeing, of course, uh, increase in demand, particularly around non-elective care. Um, what can we do? I think, David, that was your specific question. Um, so uh, I won't try and answer that comprehensively, but actually, I think there is something important about um, just recognising and thanking people for what they do now and celebrating that great stuff, because that, that is the everyday reality of what's happening in health service. Not that everybody gets it right every single time, but the aspiration is absolutely there. So I think I'd start with that. Um, I think the second thing is um, really focusing on then where are some of our biggest challenges and and, and clearly, it's linked partly to pensions, but not exclusively to that. There is a question about how we can best support the workforce in the NHS, how we can ensure that we are doing everything the people plan sets out, the interim people place, uh, plan sets out around making it the NHS a great place to work, making sure that we're retaining the talented and committed staff we have. The investment in CPD, I think, will be a part of that, but that's clearly, again, not the whole answer. Um, and then I think there is something for me about just practically third thing, really. Um, it is working with our regional colleagues, our frontline colleagues, um, and Pauline will say more about this, I think, uh, which we're now doing to undertake a, a stock take to make sure we are really clear about, I guess, where our biggest pressure points are heading into winter and that we've then marshaled our collective resources to give the best possible support to those organisations uh, that need it over these, coming, uh, over these coming months, alongside making sure, I guess, that we are uh, rolling out and supporting systems and organisations to implement what we already know works and is effective. Um, so I think those are just a, just a few thoughts on the kind of what can we, what can we do about it, but uh, I know Pauline and other colleagues will want to add. Pauline? Thanks. So, yes, just having a little bit of detail as far as emergency care is concerned and uh, elective care. Um, starting off with emergency care, I think it's set out in the paper our performance for the month of August was 86.3%, and clearly we would like it to be higher than that. However, I think the really important um, thing to say is that for the month of August, within four hours, we treated an additional 37,000 patients. So that really goes back to the point Amanda was making about how hard our staff are working at a time when demand continues to increase. Um, August alone, we saw demand um, growth of 3.9%. Now, a small amount of that was down to how we have changed our services, but essentially we are seeing an ongoing growth in demand month on month. And you know the services have been seeing this for a number of years. Um, Against that picture, as Amanda rightly highlighted, we've got significant <coughs> workforce issues, um, some of which we were very much aware that we would be dealing with and that we've been working very hard to recruit staff, etc. 
but I think in particular the pension issue is something that you know a year ago sitting in this meeting we would not have been talking about. So I think at the front door of the emergency departments, yes, our overall performance is not at the level that we would like to be able to say. We'd like to be able to say it's 95%, but I think the really strong message is our staff are seeing more patients within four hours and working very, very hard to do that. Um, just moving on a little bit for the picture outside um, uh, the, the very front of the department um, and looking at admissions to hospital. And I think there you start to see the impact of our transformation work and the reform agenda. And you know, just drawing people's attention to the fact that if you look at zero length of stay around same day emergency care, year on year an 8% increase as far as the admissions are concerned, whereas for overnight admissions it was only 2.1%. I think that's testament to the amount of work that has been done to completely transform the model about how we are going to care for patients in the future. Ultimately, the idea being, and I think everybody in this room would support it, that if you don't need to spend a night in hospital, well, nobody wants to be in hospital. And we've got clinicians right across the country working with us every day of the week to further develop those services. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we've got 100, 100 sorry, diagnostic pathways agreed. So there's 100 different types of ambulatory care pathways being used um, right across all of the NHS. Um, moving from same-day emergency care, just drawing people's attention to the ongoing work around the ambulance uh, reform agenda. And, you know, when we look at performance of the ambulance service, they, the 999 service itself has seen 141 more calls during the period of January to August. And when you look at the performance against the categories, CAF 1, CAF 2 and CAF 4, um, higher, better response times for all of those than when you compare them to last year. Um, if we move to 111 for the same period, they have seen an additional, or they have experienced an additional 123,000 calls. Um, and the really interesting stat, which I think very much links to the ambition around the reform agenda, is that we have now reached a stage when you look at um, August um, information where we are having twice as many 111 calls as 999 calls. So the whole landscape is changing and, and changing significantly. Linked to that 111 online, um, now 100% coverage across the country. And when we look at the type of coverage, it's at the phase three phase which means that a patient can receive a clinical call back. And looking at the conversion rate of people who actually go online to actually ending up in an emergency department, that being less than 10%. So these services, you know, being really the forefront of what we will be doing um, now and in the years to come. And um, behind that, a whole range of services being further developed on a day-to-day -day basis, for example, urgent treatment centres. And I think we talked about that at the previous um, meeting. Um, so that's a bit of a, uh, an insight into where we are with performance. But I think going back to the point um, that was made earlier about what can we do to do even better, which clearly is where we want to be. I think it's the ongoing drive of the transformation agenda. Um, we are developing greater and greater confidence in that and I think it is very satisfying for the people who are experienced in delivering care within um, those very different services than existed five, ten years ago. But also we've obviously identified a number of priorities that we want to focus on now and in the coming months to better prepare us for winter. Again, the board won't be very surprised about what they are because they're things that we've been talking about for a long time, but services like reducing length of stay, better for patients who are in hospital and need to go home, but also freeing up capacity for the winter period, GP streaming, focusing on weekend discharges, etc. Uh, so if it's okay, I'll move maybe from emergency care straight to um, uh, elective care. Um, and I think there, um, looking again at a similar theme emerging, whereby whilst we may not have hit 
the waiting list target um, from a percentage point of view, again, we're seeing more patients than ever before as far as RTT is concerned. Um, if you look at the change in the data from the month of June to July, um, you see the waiting list decrease by 23,000. It's a small decrease, but it's, it's significant that that is happening. And at the same time, um, if you look over the period that we are talking about, more patients being cared for um, through our elective services. No, oh, sorry, our, our, uh, through uh, yeah, uh, our elective care. Um, linked to that 52 weeks, um, we've talked about the success that we had last year in reducing long waits and we have now reached a point where if you compare um, the number of patients who are waiting more than 52 weeks in June last year um, to the number that are waiting now we've been able to reduce that by 70.7%. Clearly, we still have some way to go. We want it to be zero, but working very, very hard to achieve that. And again, just linking in the transformation agenda, working hard to do things in a different way. Um, the MSK services being increasingly rolled out across the country. We'd set ourselves an ambition for 15% by the end of the year. We believe we're going to be able to do better than that. And then other programs as described in the paper, you know, for example, the IWISE program, etc. Um, and then finally, just to finish off with the point that um, Amanda made, um, we are about to go into um, a stock take exercise similar to what we did last year, um, working with our regions, working with our frontline staff, our hospitals, our systems, to understand where they believe delivery will be um, by the beginning of December. Um, and then by the end of March, and that's on a number of different metrics, right from ED performance through to cancer care, through to the care of patients with learning disabilities, etc. And um, why is that important? It's important so as we can support um, frontline services to provide the maximum um, a level of care possible and to do it in a sensible way, um, understanding what work we can do during January, etc. etc. Um, I think that's it, probably. If it's okay, I think we'll stay on operational performance before and um, take any questions or comments on that before we move on to, to finance. Assuming that there are some questions and comments. Mm -hmm. David? So, Paul and Amanda, um, first of all, I think your core message, which is that, you know, we have, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to the people who are doing, I think, a phenomenal job in dealing with more patients um, and actually as you said, 37,000 more people in, in, in A&E. But it's reflective. We talked a lot about the supply side, essentially um, what we're doing to try and uh, boost supply to deal with, with higher numbers. I'm intrigued about how much we understand about the demand side. So, you know, some of the numbers, you know, it doesn't sound much in percentage terms, but it's a lot of people. Yes. And, and, and it won't be uniform across the country either. I would, I would hesitate to guess. So, so I'm interested in, you know, is it demography and therefore this is just going to continue? Is it change in behaviour? Um, people are more willing and will go to A&E. Is it because they can't get appointments elsewhere and they think the only way, they're not aware of the full panoply of, of options and availability that's around? Or is it something else? Because I think if we understand those and it'll obviously be a bit of all, but, but if we understand the drivers, we can start to think about how we can help patients get to the best place for them um, and choose choose the best place for them, uh, as well as tackling the supply side. So I'm just intrigued as to what we know. Yeah. So I, I think the first thing to say that um, we're focusing on demand all the time understand. to understand right across the country what is happening, why people are coming to the front door of an emergency department. Um, and clearly, sometimes they're coming to the front door of an emergency department because we have moved services around. We've co-located urgent treatment sure. centres, etc. Um, but I think if from the evidence available to date, um, we are quite clear that it's not just that, no. that we are having a genuine increase in demand. Um, 
probably in line with what we have seen previous years. Okay. But I think the really important point to make is that the service is pretty full at this point. We have maxed out the capacity okay. we have. Mm -hmm. We've maxed it out from a workforce point of view, um, from an estate point of view, etc. So if you keep seeing this level of demand, you eventually reach a point where services can't mm -hmm. deliver the way they want to. And clearly that's why the reform agenda is very important to do things in a different way. Um, I think going on to why are people turning up, um, if we park the reform agenda to one side, so they're not the people that we are sending to the departments, etc. Yes, there is an element of the here and now society. Um, you know, if a patient turns up in an emergency department, they know what that offer is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the challenge for us is to make that offer better away from the emergency department um, and that people should be able to turn up at our other services, have diagnostics at the time of need, not need to return two or three sure. times, so as that they're not choosing to walk yeah. in um, to the emergency department. And I think we heard it earlier on today being described as the sort of Amazon generation. And you know, I think we've all changed our behaviours as to what we expect and when we expect to see it. Um, Clearly, the important thing for us also is to understand on an ongoing basis whether there is any changes from a population yeah. health point of view. Um, we, we know about our ageing society, um, but we're constantly monitoring yeah. to see if, the, if there are any other issues. Um, you know, we're talking to colleagues across the border in Scotland. They talked about some of the real impact yeah. they're having around drug and alcohol. Yeah. We're watching all of those things as well. So, so I'd, I'd encourage us to really try and understand in some depth the drivers of demand because winter will come around every year yeah, yeah, yeah. and therefore you know yes. I, I, I think we we are in we have done an astonishingly good job at coping with increasing demand but we, there are only so many yeah. levers that you can yes. pull yeah. and therefore I think if we can understand that, you know, we can uh, the demand side. We can start to think about how we can intervene higher up the chain Absolutely. to make sure that yeah. we can we've got the right services for people who can choose in a sensible way yeah. the right one for them, and hopefully then we can serve them better, which is obviously what we're trying to do. And just to reassure you, we are doing this all the time. And you know, one of the really interesting things that we're doing at the moment is in a number of emergency departments actually sitting down and talking to people when they come through the front door, asking them how they have used our services or how they may yeah. not have used our yeah. services before they've chosen yeah. to walk so maybe in. Not so the we board, can feed all that. But I would love to see that. Yeah. So maybe we Absolutely. can pick up outside because I'd be really intrigued to understand yeah. those drivers. Yeah. 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 The drivers of demand. So I was going to ask about that, but I'm going to change the question. I just want to understand about numbers and the demand uh, increase year on year and the trajectory of change. Uh, is that trajectory increasing or is it plateauing off? So at least that gives us some idea of uh, what, where we're going to f be in five years' time. Uh, and the second question is, surely this just can't be a UK problem. Do we have any international comparators so that we can understand what's going on in other countries and how they're dealing with it as well, um, so that we can learn from each other? Yeah. Is, is so, you know, if we just reflect on some of the stats around attendances, and we can talk about admissions as well if you wish, but if we look at the growth that has taken place over the last 10 years around attendances to emergency departments, it's about 2.4%. When you, this is what we would expect to see. That's what we have seen. That's the trend. Last year, it was higher than that. It was 4.2%, and so far this year, it's 35 Now, we do need to subtract something from that around the reform agenda and the fact that we're bringing patients to emergency departments, but we are seeing consistent, if not increasing, levels of growth as far as demand is concerned, and that's all part of the picture of understanding what that demand is. Um, I haven't got anything with me, but I think we are very much aware, looking at stats that we've had access to, certainly around our near neighbours, looking at Wales, looking at Scotland, 
looking at Northern Ireland and that everybody is seeing or appear to be seeing a very similar picture to ourselves, in particular looking at what's happened over the course of the winter and in April onwards. And we have access to some of that information which we can share with you, but unfortunately I haven't got it with me at the moment. That is, a, that is a very important point yeah. in terms yeah. of the, uh, yeah. all of the, the, the countries in the Union seeing exactly. the same yes. underlying yeah. trend through yeah. the summer. Yes, yes. And, and you know, I think even yes. when we look at performance, we have got some um, uh, themes in common, in particular going back to the earlier conversation around the pension issue and our ability to meet that demand. Yeah. But happy to share that. I think it would be great. I, I've yeah. seen it, but I, I yes. think it would be great we, we can share, share that. the whole board. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, Joanne, you can to come in. This is obviously so important, and, and I, we can see that a lot of what you do is about supporting lo local organisations to yeah. do the best they can to manage the demand. But in, in the interest of, of also sort of um, focusing on the things that only the centre can do, or the, yeah. the, the stuff that's, that's very much in our responsibility, it's absolutely fantastic to see that 111 online is now available nationwide. And the fact that only 10% of the people who use it end up being directed into emergency care is, is incredibly reassuring. So I suppose I have, I have two questions around that. One is, now that we understand what, what sort of impact it has, should we be promoting it more actively, vigorously and publicly, given that for so many people now, the first place to go with any sort of problem is online? Um, and the second question I have is that, you know, in a, in a world where every percentage point, or in fact every basis point of demand makes a difference, um, continuously refining those algorithms and understanding the patient journey through the questions and, and tweaking them and refining them so that um, we are um, deploying them in the most effective way to give people the right answer and reduce the number of people whom we unnecessarily send into care. Can you tell us a bit about how that is being done. Yeah, so I, I think the, f the first question um, was, was around the whole issue of 111 and how we communicate. And clearly we have been careful um, in recent years to make sure that each of the services are sufficiently robust before we communicate. Um, you will be pleased to know that part of our winter campaign this year is now around 111 because we feel that the service has developed sufficient resilience that we really want to draw people's attention both to 111 and 111 online. So that will increasingly happen and you will start to see the media around that in the coming weeks and months. Sorry, your second question, I didn't quite how, get it. How, how, what are we doing to refine the, yeah. um, the algorithms within 111 online? Yes. Um, and also on the phone, but particularly online, so that we, we learn from patient journeys through yes. each question yes. to um, re refine and, and learn and make them more sophisticated and reduce the number of people who, yes. we, who take a journey through the algorithm and end up being referred yes. into face-to-face yes. -face yes. care who might otherwise have been dealt with differently. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, so you may recall that as far as um, 111 itself is concerned and 111 online, uh, that's something that we've been very careful to do um, in the rollout to understand patient behaviour and how people are availing themselves of the service and then what they are choosing to do thereafter. So, for example, if we say to a patient... Um, we honestly believe the best thing is to go to the local pharmacy, but you turn up at the hospital, etc., being able to capture that data. And, you know, through the emergency care data set, etc., we are getting better and better information around population behaviour. Um, so there's a significant focus on that. And again, happy to report it back in greater detail for 111 and 111 online. Thank but that's how we know sort of the conversion rate and who's turning up in the departments, etc. And then we can compare that to who we advise to turn up, etc. I wonder whether Noel, you yeah. want to sort of add as well, those of us that have been involved in sort of digital service businesses that are much less important and much less sophisticated than 111, recognise the question you're asking, Joanna, the importance of continual optimisation. With your NHS digital hat on, could you sure. maybe give us a bit more from uh, that? And there's an important <laughs> link to the whole e-channel strategy and David's question of demand. Mm -hmm. So of our four major digital products, e, um, NHS Online, uh, the new NHS app, the whole e-prescribing program and the e-consultation program, 
the demand that we're seeing in all four new digital channels is exceeding our expectation, which in one way is beginning to show that the products we're putting out there are well-received and well-tested. But in the Amazon generation, you know, the digital channels are generating new demand, and a lot of that comes through in the triage process, the algorithms which drive the triage process, and people checking more often about symptoms that they might have otherwise waited for a physical consultation. So the benefits, if you take them in the round, which you know, hopefully come through in um, Pauline's figures to some degree in being able to cope with that steep curve of demand, are also being seen in different ways. The benefits of patients knowing more about their condition, knowing where to go, knowing how to access the right solution, going to pharmacy, which we're going to talk about the new pharmacy contract, which is a massive breakthrough in terms of activating a pharmacy channel as a new part of the spectrum of offer. Um, it is a demand-driven healthcare system that we have, and uh, the more we create new channels, the more activity we get, but so we get new demand that might not have otherwise been there. So... It's a helpful suite, and there are more rollouts in the NHS app with new functions coming on stream next year, which will help improve the offers progressively. Any other questions or comments on the operations? Um, I, I have one. I just Having just talked a lot about demand, I'd just like to swing back to supply. Um, maybe direct this maybe to, to Ruth, just to talk a bit more about what we um, plan to do, this is with my people plan hat on, to upweight the work on retention, because clearly the, the single most sort of powerful immediate lever we can pull to um, increase supply is to make the NHS a better place to work so that more of our fantastic staff want to stay with us for longer or work a bit longer with us as a result. And I just wondered if you could talk a bit more about what we're doing now and what more we could do in, in the near term. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dido. So the NHSI um, started um, the work on uh, the retention and retention collaborative using a quality improvement methodology uh, two years uh, ago now. We've started with a third of our community and um, acute trusts and all of our mental health trusts. And slowly by slowly, we've been working with all of our trust. And we've got some great people working on this. Um, Professor Mark Radford uh, in my team has been leading it with a, a number of uh, great individuals from all sorts of backgrounds, um, HR backgrounds, clinical backgrounds, um, economic uh, backgrounds, and they've been superb. And what we've seen so far is that the trusts that have done the best are when they've got the HR director and the director of nursing working together and jointly owning it. Not one or the other, and indeed not delegated to the deputy of a deputy of another deputy. And I think what we've seen is the turnover rate has gone from 12.5% to 117 And in mental health, it's even better than that. It's 9.6 to 8.6. So um, it's, it's working. It's working really well, but it needs to be scaled up. Um, and that's a recommendation that I'm working very well with the Chief People Officer, Perena, and we're just currently working out how we can scale up, what will be the return on investment. Um, but we have nine or so, nine individuals working extremely hard, but actually it's the trust themselves that are doing that work. They're the ones that are sharing the learning. They're the ones that are focusing down on what are the key uh, things they need to do. What we're seeing as well are the trusts going, actually, it uh, depends where they are, um, it depends what challenges they've got, is whether they need to focus on those people that are newly recruited in, not just those newly qualified, but newly recruited in, where they need more nurturing, where they need more um, uh, care and career management. We've also seen that how do we uh, oh. extend those people's careers in terms of time frame. So those people that are the over 50 mark, how do we help them to have fulfilling careers in all sorts of different ways right um, until the, the very last day that they want to be with us. So stretching both ends is really important. CPD is going to be critical. CPD is what people tell us will make a difference to how they can um, have a career in the NHS um, and 
and I'm hopeful that will be there. And I'm hopeful now that we'll work with trust directors of nursing, university suppliers, trust themselves that we'll be able to provide some of this training, that we'll be able to keep people. So yes, it's, it's working well. Um, but there's much more that we could do to uh, industrialise it. Thank you. Can we move on to um, a verbal update on the month for financials, Julian, I think? Sure. Um, so uh, at the end of month four, I mean, we've now got month five data from the rest, but uh, at, at the end of month four, um, the NHS commissioners and providers out there who spend the vast majority of the money were off plan by £75 million on a £39.5 billion uh, spend. Um, so, you know, sort of more or less holding it uh, there and forecasting, broadly speaking, to be on plan. What's interesting when you sort of dig under the numbers is that um, somewhere around 25% 49 commissioners are showing a sort of an adverse variance to plan and uh, broadly the other 75% are absolutely on track and for providers um, probably roughly a third are actually showing an adverse variance to plan although the variance per trust is much smaller than that uh, for commissioners and the vast bulk are actually showing just to be slightly ahead of, of, of plan. Um, probably looking at the forecast numbers now, I think is not worth too much uh, money. What we're actually re really trying to assess is what's the risk that we're really um, mm -hmm. sitting on. And I guess the great advantage uh, this year of bringing E and I together is the ability to, to, in the round. to properly look at uh, commissioners and providers in the round. Which I have to say is probably you, you, we're also seeing real evidence of that and enabling much better system conversations about how uh, problems and financial problems and performance problems together are being solved. But sat here today, we think we are sat on a kind of material risk of sort of five to six hundred million pounds, which in the scheme of about uh, you know 120 billion pounds to spend might not sound a lot, but would be hugely problematic. And, uh, of course, different this year to maybe last is that we really have put the money out into the system uh, through um, the increase in prices and allocations and, indeed, uh, then the additional support through the Provider Sustainability Fund and the Financial Recovery Fund. So we absolutely do need uh, the system commissioners and providers to deliver against the plans that they have themselves agreed through the planning process. So loads of work going on uh, largely through our regional teams with systems and then with individual organisations. Uh, I guess I sit here and there are definitely some trusts we are bothered about and probably the risk we're looking at is split about equally between trust um, and commissioners but probably this year compared to last, we are you know, more materially worried about the commissioner position. And we have definitely seen uh, certain groups of commissioners in the Northwest and in the Midlands in particular showing material sort of adverse. And so whilst across the whole country, it's how we're driving the improvement productivity programs uh, on the commissioner side, I think in particular, how do we really drive uh, better value, improve cost control around prescribing, uh, both low value prescribing, the medicine reviews, the, you know, the gearing up of GPs and uh, pharmacists to uh, really get um, a grip of some of these issues with uh, commissioners. And then we are having to think, at least in a few places, is there a more structural intervention uh, required, which is the sort of ongoing conversation we are having with uh, our regional directors at the moment. Um, that's probably uh, what is worth saying now. Okay. Actually, actually I, I will say, uh, sorry, just two things. I think next time we come back, we'll have more to say on capital. Actually, uh, yeah. more capital has gone into the system but we have a real requirement in particular from the provider sector for taught capital forecasts as we now are at the mid-year point, in large part to work out do we actually have the capacity to release some more funding to begin to do catch-up work, in particular yeah. around sort of critical maintenance backlogs, 
but we can only do that if we have taught forecasts. So that's the real plea uh, to the whole of the, mm. in particular, the provider sector. Uh, I was just thinking of the uh, retention point. When you dig under the numbers, in particular in the provider sector, uh, basically we are running slightly over pace on pay and under pace on sort of uh, non-pay year to date. And on pay, what's particularly interesting is the kind of agency number. Yeah. It's basically holding the same rate as last year. I think people had planned that it would, it, we would be seeing a, a decrease. Okay. I think it just goes to the point of how do we improve not just recruitment but retention and how important that is if we're honestly going to get a grip of some of the cost drivers which are giving us problems. Yes. Yes, agreed. Any questions for Julian? Any comments? Can I Andrew. Our potential success going forward depends on system working and getting a grip locally of, of the issues. How, how well do we feel that system working is, is being you know, developed? Because I think we've still got, still got a range of um, approaches and you know, we tend to look at the, the top performing systems, but I think the big focus should be on the, on the, the other mm -hmm. end of the scale really around how we can support local leaders to actually get a grip on some of the issues that we've talked about, be it finance and performance. And I think you know, anything we can do, and Amanda in particular, to, to encourage people to work together and actually handle and tackle some of these issues going forward will be our success or failure as, yeah, we, okay. as we get into the winter. Amanda, do you want to pick that up? I know you've spent quite a bit of time with system leaders in your first few weeks in the job. Yeah, happy to. Um, so I think... Uh, I think that's a really important point, and it's uh, clearly um, a both and at the moment because we are both working through a kind of well established and well understood set of arrangements based around sort of individual organisations within the system, and we're working with systems, and um, uh, that's that's got to be right. Um, but I think the work that certainly we're trying to do. Um, executive team, but particularly working with Ian, with Julian, um, uh, with, with other colleagues, is now to try and really hone down over the next couple of months what the ask is of systems. Um, and uh, we literally just had a conversation about it before this meeting, and uh, yesterday we were out talking to ICS leads and chairs about their experiences. I had another event last week with a different group of people talking about you know, their different perspectives and different parts of the system. And I think what comes through is a, is a, is a strong desire for a kind of greater clarity, um, an equally strong desire for that to be co-created with the NHS, which I think we would all agree is absolutely right, uh, and, and a sense of kind of getting the right balance between um, recognising the very successful variation that exists at the moment which is good and responsive to local needs but providing sufficient clarity about uh, direction of travel and about expectations of systems such that people are empowered to get on and do the stuff they need to do so i think that's the bit that we're just trying to kind of crystallize and we'll be trying to do that over the next couple of months in parallel though and i think kind of importantly because that could be a slightly sort of theoretical exercise we've also agreed with uh, regional colleagues some areas now um, that we will start to work in practice to try and sort of prototype what that kind of, uh, I suppose, genuine support model could look like at system level that would touch on some of the kind of financial realities of what needs to be delivered, but very much alongside a focus on all of the other things we've talked about around quality and constitutional standards as well. Okay, thank you. Really and I think that's probably a very good summary of the whole discussion, which is we need to be able to focus both on the, the long-term direction of travel and consult and engage and bring people with us, but also act on the, in the here and now, recognising quite how hard staff are working across the NHS and how important it is that we support them and deploy resources to support them in the areas that most need it as we run in towards winter. Okay, any final comments on operational and financial performance? Should we move on? Okay, thank you all. Um, so, Ian, back to you, community pharmacy. Thank you very much. Can I invite Ed to join us? Excellent. Here on uh, community pharmacy. 
it's fantastic um, today to be talking about community pharmacy here at the boards. Um, in July this year, we reached a landmark deal, uh, which marks a sea change in our relationship with the sector. And I want to pay tribute particularly to Simon Jukes, the Chief Executive of the Pharmaceutical Services Negotiating Committee, Jeanette Howe in the Department of Health and Social Care and her team, and Ed and Lisa here in NHS England and Improvement and their team, uh, who've really brought an energy and a focus to our work on community pharmacy. This is the first ever five-year settlement in NHS history, and it provides really important financial certainty for pharmacies at a period of profound change because the traditional high street model is being disrupted by the rapid growth of online dispensing. Um, and to assist with reform of dispensing uh, and help uh, confront some of those challenges, this deal will now enable wider use of hub and spoke automation for all pharmacies, um, small independents as well as the large multiples, um, as well as changes to skill mix. Uh, pharmacies will now, under this deal, do more for the NHS, delivering new clinical services. Uh, they become a more integral part of the urgent care system, um, something Noel and Pauline, you've just been talking about. And this five-year deal isn't just you know, uh, for the medium term, it's for now, uh, because uh, the new 111 referral service to community pharmacy um, for consultations being booked directly starts this October in time to help with winter. And pharmacies will also do more to prevent ill health, for example, uh, by helping to detect the very high levels we know of undetected hypertension which exist in our communities. So this is, I think, a good deal for the sector. It's fair for the taxpayer and it's beneficial for the NHS and I really commend it to the boards. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Richard. I'm a little bit very good. <laughs> good start. Th thank you for that, Richard. Good, there's, a, there's a but. There's a but, but. There's a but it's coming. Because we have actually now agreed it. With the <laughs> <laughs> oh, so interesting commentary. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, what we've got here, we all appear to look at the papers, is we've got a deal with the pharmacists that will give us more from them. They've yeah, coped with, as the rest of the NHS already has coped through increasing volume, and we're going to get that for about 200 million quid less in five years' time than we paid two years ago. So an eight-year period, we're going to pay them about 200 million pound less, and they're giving us sh a shed load more stuff. Now, that feels, that feels brilliant to me. So that's my bit about it, brilliant. I guess my question is, is, that, is, is how do I explain that and there's sort of there's one of three possible explanations and you might say it's the first one of them and the first one is we did a pretty rubbish job in the past on this <laughs> hand up i was responsible for this <laughs> for this area um, ah, now we're getting to second it. possibility second possibility is yeah here is a sector that really is transforming itself that really is has thought about now how you do a lot more but actually spend less per unit of activity on it Third bit is actually we're squeezing the margins too much on this and we push them to the point where that could create problems for us in the future. And I guess what I'm trying to understand a bit is which of those three things? So I'll it? offer a quick take and then Ed can come in and correct me when I get it wrong. So on your first point, I'd say yes, community pharmacy has been actually a bit of a neglected sector. Yeah. And that's, I think, both to the detriment of the NHS and it's also been to the detriment of community mm. pharmacy itself. I'd say, yes, it is transforming, mm. and there is huge scope for transformation. Mm. Um, I mentioned uh, dispensing reform. Yeah. You know, we've got a, we yeah. spend a lot of money on a network um, of highly skilled professionals, um, primarily through mm. dispensing. Okay. And there's a big set of opportunities. Mm. I mentioned hub and spoke automation. Um, I mentioned online distribution rather than just physical face-to-face, <coughs> -face, and skill mix changes mm. as well as we end up with more pharmacists increasingly working in primary care networks, um, doing uh, increasingly complex work, not least bearing in mind we can't get as many GPs as we would like. So secondly, yes, there is a, a really big um, efficiency opportunity. And then third, in terms of the 
um, the value. This deal does provide stability. It comes against a context where there have been uh, recent mm -hmm. uh, cash reductions. Mm -hmm. um, we have also seen an increase in recent years in the number of uh, community pharmacies in this country, which we haven't seen in some of the other countries, and that follows okay. market liberalisation that happened 15 or so um, years ago. Um, and I, I would mention that some of those dispensing reforms will help the sector um, deal with efficiency. And one of the nice things about having a five-year deal is that actually it, it becomes in the interest of the sector to try and work out how it can deliver yeah. some of the cost efficiencies now. And one of the reasons why we struggle to unlock those changes is the extent to which if you're yeah. just doing a one-year deal, it's been yeah. less of an obvious reason for uh, pursuing mm -hmm. that. And then I'd say what we're currently doing is uh, rebalancing of spend. So community pharmacy can see a really important future more closely linked to the NHS where the balance of spending between dispensing, relatively speaking, goes down, bearing in mind the efficiencies, and we begin to work up more clearly spend on sets of clinical services okay. that properly connect with and support the NHS and indeed the wider public health work we're doing. Excellent. Steve, if you want to... Well, Molly has really made the point, which was to focus on the pharmacy workforce mm. rather than the... The, the community uh, pharmacies and the, the pharmacists are of course an incredibly skilled workforce uh, and it's really essential both for their professional satisfaction and for the NHS and for patients that we that we use them uh, and all the skills that they have so so I think it's important to see this in the context of the increasing value and work they do in secondary care to assist our secondary care clinicians, in primary care, which is the, one of the cornerstones of the GP contract, in, and of course they're not alone there, we include paramedics and others, uh, but pharmacies will pharmacists have much more they can bring to, pharma, to primary care, and we are we are supporting that, and GPs are supporting that, and, and then of course in community pharmacies. So I think it's a great example of how when it comes to the people plan we are ensuring that we use the skill mix in all the great staff that we have in the NHS and other areas that support the NHS to its fullest. Can I add one other thing on the workforce, which is, um, apart from clinical pharmacists, uh, we also have a huge opportunity with recent reform and you know, recognition and support for pharmacy technicians. Yes. And I think we will start to see a real growth in their numbers in the next few years, and that will help um, a variety of sectors. It will help the community pharmacy sector, and it will also help primary care. Brilliant. I'm mindful of everyone's time. Many, briefly. Just a brief, brief question. Good um, step forward. Just wondering about the training requirements, if they're going to look after minor illnesses as urgent care, <coughs> and the training requirements might be different for somebody who's working on a single isolated pharmacy compared to those who are working in in a, in a chain pharmacy and, and, and the standardisation of that uh, training? So the, so, the, so the way the service has been designed uh, for its rollout in October is it effectively directs to pharmacy the sort of conditions you'd expect to be walking off the street into a pharmacy anyway and within the clinical scope of practice for a, for a pharmacist in their training. Um, so it's it, you know it may be more conservative than in the long run with extra training and support you could you could support the workforce to deliver. Uh, nevertheless, um, we have to make sure that uh, everyone delivering the service in the pharmacy is competent to do so. So the service specification is very clear about the obligations on the owners of pharmacies, the contract contract holders, to make sure competent staff are, are certified as competent and and delivering in the pharmacy and we are going to make available training courses to make sure that things like red flag symptoms for sepsis etc are well recognised by the people delivering the service. So those training courses will be available online to the pharmacists that they can access? Uh, those training courses will be available in face to face, um, <coughs> you know, the proper training packages as well as online, yeah. And I think the point in the then goes into primary care as well, is ensuring that we support our staff in terms of the extra skills that they might sure. need is well made, and in pharmacy in particular, the chief pharmaceutical officer, if he was here, would make that point, and it is in some, indeed something that we are considering as part of the people plan as to how we uh, address that. Okay, thank you. So uh, mine's just an observation, which is um, I had the great privilege to be out with the co-op in Lincolnshire who have 48 pharmacists, community pharmacists. 
uh, just after this. And I have to say there is, consider A, they do a phenomenally good job being rooted in the local communities. Secondly, they are really keen to play a full role in the local health service. And thirdly, the, the uh, length of the contract gives them some planning horizon, which is critical for them to, to think. So I think, you know, they feel, um, and Ed, I need to put you in touch with them, they feel really well placed, I think. The question is how to leverage those subgroups. We always think of the very big and the very small. Actually, there's a, there's a strong thing in the middle who potentially have huge leverage for us. And, and one of the things that I would observe quite strongly is the development of the workforce we've got is how do we link the pharmacists in GPs, the community <coughs> pharmacists and the pharmacists in secondary to be able to give career development, career support, etc., etc. Because actually I think it would be quite dangerous if we had the odd pharmacist sat in the odd office somewhere in a GP on their own. Yeah. So I think we need to think about that as well as through the thing. I, we're, I think we're, con I'm push, we're pushed for time, so I'd suggest you pick that up later, but I think there's a real opportunity yeah. there. Take the challenge and work it, and we'll move on, if that's okay. Excellent. Ruth. It's from for information. Yeah. Um, my paper, um, Neil and Olivia lead this piece of work. It's um, an annual update of um, our public and participation um, work. <laughs> More things that we need to be doing, and we were having a discussion pre-board, um, but it is for your information as a board. Excellent. Are there any questions? Clearly, this is a very important part of our responsibilities uh, uh, in both boards. <coughs> okay. Thank you. We will take it as read, if that is okay. Um, which takes us back to Ian again. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, we know that the government has given um, a positive assessment of uh, performance against the NHS England mandate for both 2017-18 and 2018-19, most recently 55 of 60 assessed objectives being green or amber green. Uh, secondly, we now have a clear new mandate for 2019-20, which covers both NHS England and NHS improvement. And thirdly, henceforth, uh, we will have a single integrated assessment against that, including uh, formal six monthly reporting uh, following the model we currently adopt for NHS England, and we expect there to be public assessment um, against that joint mandate. Any questions or comments on the mandate? Good. In which case, uh, are, is there any other business for anyone? No? Yeah. Yeah, seal, seal, seal report is start and that's done. Um, I purposefully tried to leave us a little bit of time at the end because I am mindful that a number of members of the public, and you've been very patient sitting for a long time, uh, I wanted to just explain why we weren't taking a question in the middle of the board meeting, uh, but also make sure that there is a bit of time for us to have an informal conversation with anyone who does, who's travelled to, to come to the board meeting, meeting who does want to. So just so, and I probably should have said this at the beginning, um, just so everyone is aware, uh, this is a, uh, it's two board meetings in common in public. It is not a public meeting, mm -hmm. which is why we don't take questions in the, in the board meeting itself. And that's part of the, the, the setup um, uh, and constitutional arrangements for, for NHS England that we've adopted as we meet in common. But I think both David's, both David's and I feel quite strongly that we do really want to make sure that we're accessible to members of the public, that we um, take questions wherever we can, um, both face to face and electronically. So I, I'm hoping we've left ourselves an extra 15 or 20 minutes because the private meeting doesn't need to start until five. So if there is anyone who has been patient and stayed with us and is now, now in the rain, um, who wants to have some um, uh, informal time with either David or I, we can free that time up now for the next 15 minutes. And we will do that going forward in each of our meetings. And I would say, David, who spent quite a long time, I don't know if you want to yeah. take two minutes so, to describe the conversation yeah. you had so with the uh, people from Swindon. Yes, so I think first of all is um, they've clearly had a uh, pretty bad experience, both locally, but also in the way that we've interacted with them. And I think we need to ask ourselves two questions. One is, what happened? But secondly, why was it that they felt the only way they could get heard was to actually okay. travel from Swindon to here? And I think we need to ask ourselves some questions 
on that. Um, I've committed to go back to the lady, Kate, who, uh, Kate Lenehan, who um, was, uh, I think, bringing them together to, to help facilitate the, the raising of concerns. And I think, Simon, it's something that maybe you and I can speak yeah. after, because I've put my name on the line to make sure they get an answer. Thank you for doing that on behalf of both boards. So the public board is now closed. If I could ask all the directors to reconvene at five o'clock, and David and I are available if people want to talk to us. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs>